Hi, this is the um, specific heat capacity required practical, right? And I'm just going to go through right all the details to do with that. Now, firstly, specific heat capacity, you need to know the definition. So specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required, right, to raise the temperature of one kilogram of substance by one degree C. This is then the formula, right, E equals MC theta, energy in joules, mass in kilograms, change in temperature in degree C. These are then the units of specific heat capacity, but what I would tend to do is I'll tend to write it as joules per kilogram degree C. Okay, it's just kind of easier to remember than the little minus ones on there. Now, the apparatus itself. Now, it can be a little bit complicated, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of go through it. You have three types of blocks, probably. Copper, iron, aluminium. So there's your block there. All right, and it's just like a cylinder of metal with a couple of holes in it. You've got a thermometer, which is there. You've got a pipette, which is then for putting a little tiny bit of oil into the thermometer's hole. You've got a power supply. You should then have insulation around the outside. So if I just kind of draw insulation on. An ammeter, not sure which is which, can't read it. Voltmeter, stop clock. I'll draw a stop clock, there's a stop clock. Okay. Mass balance, for actually measuring the weight or the mass rather of the metal block. A variable resistor. And if you're really lucky, a joule meter. Right, so this is then the um, apparatus then you need to set up. So this here is your block of metal. Whoops. The bit that's shaded on the outside, this bit here, is your insulation. Right, just try and keep the heat in as much as you possibly can. This bit here is where you put your heater, and then obviously you've got a thermometer on the other side. This circuit here, so that is your power pack. The electricity passes through the ammeter, it then goes into the heater, it comes out of the heater, back, and then what we can also do is we can also do the voltage. So the practical itself. Measure and record the mass of the copper block in kilograms. Okay, so what you've got to do is you've got to get the mass of that block. Insulate the block and assemble the circuit. Put the heater in the large hole and the thermometer in the small hole with a little bit of oil. Right, so what you've got here is you've got a little bit of oil in there, and that is then just to make sure that the thermometer gets the accurate temperature. Measure the temperature at the start. Record the temperature every minute for 10 minutes. Record the results on your table. And then the whole point then is to calculate your specific heat capacity. Now on this one, I've also just then included the variables. So don't mess. So the measure during the practical itself is your temperature. Don't mess in class. What you change between your practicals is the metal block. And what stuff stays the same is things like, <coughs> things like your voltage and your current. Now that's the principle behind the actual practical itself. And that's okay. So then what you've got to do is you've got to do your calculations. And usually what you'll get asked to calculate is the specific heat capacity. So you need to do a little bit of kind of algebra rearranging it. So you've got your change in thermal energy. And because you've got your M and your change in temperature on that side, what you've got to do is you've got to divide them. So it goes underneath mass times change in temperature equals C, which is your specific heat capacity. Now that's fine, right, because in your experiment, you can calculate the mass dead easy. You put it on a mass balance. You can calculate the change in temperature very easy because it's the temperature at the start to the temperature at the end. That's dead straightforward. The hardest part is calculating the thermal energy. If you've got a joule meter in the actual practical itself, then you just read it off the joule meter. Okay, and then what you can do then is you can then say, this is the joule meter reading, this is the mass, this is the change in temperature, which is the temperature at the end, take away the temperature at the start, and that then equals your specific heat capacity. But if you've only got a voltmeter and ammeter, you need to go through this process. You've got your ammeter, I'll do it in a different colour so it stands out, you've got your ammeter and you've got your voltage. All right, so they are then from your experiment itself where you're doing the ammeter and the voltmeter. From that, you then need to calculate the power. So you times the current by the voltage to get your power. Okay. 
When you've got your power, you then have to multiply your power times the time in seconds to get your energy. Okay, and what that then does is that then calculates your energy so then you can use it back into the actual formula itself. Now, this bit here is getting pretty tricky, all right? But what you've got to do is you've just got to be aware of the fact that that can happen. Now, uh, you might also get asked about specific heat capacity of a liquid. You do exactly the same thing. There is no difference at all. all right? The only difference is that instead of having a mass of a certain metal, what you've got is you've got the mass of a certain liquid instead. All right? So you do exactly the same practical itself. Um, here's some examples, a copper block, an aluminium block, and water. All right, so copper block, specific heat capacity is 390 joules per kilogram. Specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 joules per kilogram. Now, what that actually means is, it means that the copper block warms up and cools down quickly. If it's got a high specific heat capacity, it warms up and cools down slowly, and it takes a lot longer for the temperatures to actually change. Now, issues with it, okay? What you can do is you can find that there is a number of issues with the practical itself. Thermal energy passing out of the beaker into the air, all right? So what you've got, if you're doing it as a liquid, what you'll find is you'll find that liquid or heat comes out of the beaker or comes out of the metal block. What you can do with that is just use an insulator. Another problem is not all the thermal energy is passing into the oil. You've got to make sure that the immersion heater is submerged or directly into the actual block itself. If you've then got sort of like a manual device of some sort, like a thermometer, in any practical ever, what you can do is you can say, well, you've got a thermometer. Best way of improving it is use an electronic thermometer, an electronic temperature probe. Then, again, this is more based on the liquid one. If you've got thermal energy right within there, what you've got to do is you've got to make sure you're stirring it to make sure that the heat is getting transferred throughout. Now, that was very, very brief on the specific heat capacity. All right, now it's relatively straightforward, right, if you've got a joule meter. Right, if you've got a joule meter, what it'll do, it'll just tell you the amount of joules. Right, and that is the most likely version. If it doesn't talk about a joule meter, then you need to go through those other two formulas, right, to make sure that you understand exactly how you're going to get to the amount of energy then provided. So with this one, you need a definition of what specific heat capacity is. You need to be able to do the method. You need to do the calculations. Right, and what you need to do is you need to be able to discuss those two. Once you've done those, right, just have a bit of an idea, like I said before, about copper and water, about what the specific heat capacity actually means.